freaking me out a little bit. Anybody else? I mean, I have. Has anybody ever? Who's been in like uh, in this area forever? Well, almost forever. It's like, have you guys seen this much rain? I mean, it's like every stinking day. I mean, I am just totally just blown away by it. I've, I've been like, where's the sunshine? I thought they were supposed to. So the sun comes out, right, so that we can still be named like 300 days of sunshine a year. And then all of a sudden, boom, it goes away. It's like an all of a sudden kind of a deal. So uh, this morning, I am going to talk to you um, about some stuff that... Uh, I'm just going to talk to you about some stuff. So anyway, anybody, anybody ever flown on an airplane before? Okay. Anybody ever have the most amazing experience we've, uh, most of us have flying on an airplane? And, um, and some airlines, as you know, are better than others, right? And, um, and Maria and I, you know, have had an opportunity to travel all over the world, and we've had many, many different experiences, shall I say, with uh, how airlines operate. And I remember this one time I was in China, and we were sitting on the tarmac and uh, on a Chinese aircraft, and it was like, and it was sweltering inside. You knew exactly what the Chinese people eat. <laughs> garlic. Lots of garlic, man. It's just oozing through the pores, you know, so garlic and sweat at the same time was not a great smell. And uh, so you have all these different experiences when you, when you travel. And so, um, and so I've kind of deemed some airlines, some different uh, things, uh, so here's, here you have cranky British Airways. I don't know if you've ever flown on British Airways, but if you're an American, a U.S. person flying on, US, on, on British Airways, they are cranky. I mean, it's like, I'm like, you ask for a glass of water, it's like this snooty thing. I'm like, wow, excuse me, because obviously I didn't pronounce it correctly. Um, I didn't say water. I said Water. <laughs> um, and then you've got the down to the business, down to business American Airlines. You just kind of get on board with, with American, and they just kind of do their thing. And it's just kind of like, they, it's, it's, just, it's just, there's no really attention to anything. It's just get your butt in the seat and let's take off. And then you've got the fun Southwest Airlines. You heard about that Southwest person who craw crawled up in the uh, baggage compartment and all that kind of stuff, and it was on the news. They didn't get fired or anything because they're fun Southwest Airlines, everybody. And how they do their little call, you know, their yeah. pre-flight stuff. I mean, they get really creative with all that. So I call them fun Southwest. And then uh, the uncomfortable Frontier Airlines, the non-reclining seats in Frontier Airlines, the seats with no padding in Frontier Airlines, it is just absolutely obnoxious. And so hopefully you just have a short flight and you can get there. Uh, you know, I'm threatened to b bring my own, like cut my own foam out, you know, and kind of roll it up and bring it with me and set it, you know, <laughs> create my own. Um, and then you got, I, like, I love this one, then you got a la carte spirit airlines. And um, I call it a la carte because you have to pay for your seat. You have to pay for your seat belt. You have to pay for your carry-on. You have to pay for your checked bag. You have to pay for your snacks. And I'm waiting for the day that they're going to have that credit card swiper right in front so that in case the cabin pressure does get lost in, in there, that you have to swipe the card in order for the oxygen mask to fall. So that's what I'm waiting for because it's like everything else you pay for. I mean, I'm like, are you flipping kidding me? It's like, do I get anything on this airline, you know? Um, and so... Uh, and so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's very bare. <laughs> it's really naked. Um, and so much to the point that you have to pay for your own O2. So, but the one thing that all of these airlines have in common is their rehearsed speech at the beginning of the flight. They all have to say something in regards to and show you how to fasten, buckle a seatbelt, which is anyway, um, and 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 all that kind of stuff. And then they get to this one line in there. It says, in the event of the change in cabin pressure, an oxygen mask will drop from the panel above your seat. Ever think about that? If you're flying at 30,000 feet and all of a sudden you're descending at this angle, where is that oxygen mask? I've always thought about that. You know, it's like you're everybody's, and you're in your buckled in your seatbelt, so nobody gets an oxygen mask. Anyway, so... Um, it's like it's like a it's like a carrot before it's like everybody's like gonna grab uh, anyway. So um, my own brain sometimes gets in the way. So um, so in the, in the event of a cabin pressure change, right, the start of flow of the oxygen, pull the mask towards you, place it firmly over your nose and mouth, secure the elastic band. You know, then they show you how to do the elastic band in case you didn't know how to do those, um, and then. Uh, 
And then what's it say? Uh, plastic band over your head and breathe normally. <laughs> that's another thing. That's it. That just cracks me. It's like, you, hey, listen, I'm descending at this altitude. I don't think I'm breathing normally at that point. I think I'm going, doo, doo, <laughs> right? It's like hyperventilation. Um, Anyway, um, if you're traveling with a child or someone who requires assistance, secure your mask on first and then assist the other person. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, Assist the other person. Keep your mask on until a uniformed crew member advises you to remove it. I don't know if I would. I'd be like, I'm not taking it off. (laughs) You know, it's like, so anyway. So as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about this whole thing in regards to traveling with a child or someone who requires assistance, secure your mask on first, and then assist others. In Jude chapter 1, here's going to be our reference for this morning, verse 20 through 23, it says this, but you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourselves safe in God's love. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do not but do so with great caution, hating the sin that contaminates their life. So as we get into Jude, but prior to us getting into it, let's find out who Jude was. Jude was actually the half brother of Jesus. Um, possibly his name was actually shortened from Judas to Jude, um, just because of why do you think his name might have been shortened? Okay, there you go, because Judas Iscariot, right? He was a skeptic at first. He was one of those that were um, around when Jesus was around, yet at the same time when he was around, when Jesus was around, um, he didn't really believe in Jesus. How many know if your half-brother, if your brother would claim to be the Messiah, how many think you would be skeptical? Okay, you should be skeptical because there's no other Messiah, just so you know. But in case that ever were to happen, um, and some of you are going, there is no way they're the Messiah, right? But um, and you already know that. But the point being is that that so Jude was skeptical at first, but it wasn't until then, after after Jesus had shown Himself very real, did he then at that point in time become a believer, become a follower of Christ. It wasn't after until later on that that, that Jude and also Jesus' brothers actually became followers of Him. It wasn't until then, and so. Um, he had a black and white, so, so what's interesting about Jude versus Judas, right? There's a complete black and white difference between the two. Judas did what? Betrayed. Betrayed Christ. Jude was standing up going, man, you can't do this. And that's what the whole book of Jude is about. It's about talking about false doctors, false doctrine, false teachers, and those kind of things. People who were coming out saying things that weren't accurate, that weren't doctrinally correct. Jude was making a stand for what was right against everything that was wrong. In other words, Jude was a complete contrastal difference between Judas, which is kind of interesting, right? Isn't it interesting how the Bibles, there's always these redeeming values that you can see throughout Scripture? I think it's pretty awesome. So he was uh, coming against false teachers. Um, the words that these false teachers were saying were, seemed so amazing. And uh, how many know it's important for you to read the Word of God for yourself? Right? I mean, it's really, really important that you're just not listening to somebody else. Because how many know somebody could say something that sounds really, really cool and really, really awesome, but how many know that it's not necessarily true? There's a lot of that kind of stuff that goes on in the church even till, still today, when you t- especially when you take a look at the whole grace message. How many know grace is true? How many know grace is amazing? How many know grace is for everyone? Right? How many know Jesus provided that for us? So let's understand that. But how many know grace doesn't allow you to continue on doing your sin? It just doesn't do that. That's not what the purpose of grace is. Grace is the ability to be able to say, it's okay, get back up, move forward. But grace isn't there just so that you can keep on doing what you were doing. How many know that the Bible strictly says, don't keep doing that? You know, don't keep pushing in that same direction. So he was, uh, he was encouraging to the followers of Jesus to stand strong and not to get weak need in the middle of difficult times. How many know that during the time, during the time that Jude and all that kind of was, was written, that Jude wrote this, how many know there was difficult times going on for the disciples? 
those that were followers of Christ were running in some very difficult times, whether it was false teachers, other people that were rising up, or the persecution that was taking place within, during that time. And so there was a very difficult season for Jude and for the followers of, of Jesus. And so it was, that is kind of how this is kind of, kind of capsulated. This is what's going on in that, during that time frame of what's happening. How many know it's important to know what's happening when the scriptures are being written? Because it gives you a different perspective. It gives you a perspective that goes, oh, okay. So they're going through a difficult season. Anybody ever been through a difficult season in your own faith? Anybody ever been through a difficult season where others have challenged you in your faith? Anybody ever had difficulty going, man, is that right? Is that not right? Is that right? And so you're kind of, you're challenged in all those kind of things. So, so that's, that's what Jude is addressing here um, in these passages of Scripture. So let's break it down. Let's go to Jude. And I say chapter one, but how many know there's only one, one chapter in Jude? So, um, but in Jude 20, because if I say Jude 20, everybody's like, where's chapter 20? So uh, that's why I say chapter one, verse 20. Um, it says this, says, but you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jude was encouraging the church here to stay strong during, very di- during this very difficult season. He was trying to encourage the church members, hey, listen, guys, stay true, hold strong, hold fast, right? And we're going to see that here. Now, he goes in to say, he says, B- you must what? Build, and now in the New Living Translation, it says, build each other up. In other translations, it says, build yourself up. So in other translations, it actually says, build yourself up. Now, why would there be a discrepancy between building yourself up and building each other up? Well, actually, the word that is used here, it actually does both things. That's why. So it can be a, it can be a me thing, and it can also be a we thing. And so, when the, so I take it as it should be both. It should be a, a me thing, and it also should be a we thing. I mean, it, it needs to be both, not just one. So build yourself up or, and build each other up, okay? So the word can mean either, either or. So it's kind of like, but in order to build somebody else up, what did we learn about the airplane stories? You have to put your mask on first. You got to put your O2 on first before you can assist somebody else. And so it's really important before I can assist anybody else, encourage anybody else, how many know I need to be encouraged myself? If I'm not encouraged myself, how many know I'm going to be a discouragement to others? So I have to be in that myself. So this word here, to build, it means this, to be put upon a foundation. In other words, when you build something, this word build here particularly means it's put on something. It's, there's a foundation. There's something that is underneath it that holds the structure up. Does that make sense? And then I can build. But if I don't have something to build on, how many know if you don't, like say if I had a house, I had no cement foundation, and I were just to kind of put up some wood on the ground, how many know it wouldn't last very long? So you have to have the concrete foundation. And what is that concrete foundation? It's, it's Jesus and the Word. I mean, He is our foundation. He is our example. That's why He came to this earth. He didn't come to this earth to go, hey, abracadabra, look at all these amazing things I can do. No, He came to this earth to go, hey, listen, not only can, am I doing these things, but you get to do these things too. And not only these things, but even greater things you can do. How many think that's pretty awesome? And so he comes and so based on that foundation, now I have something that I can do what? I can build on. So what does it take to build? Any construction people in the room? What's it take to build? Knowledge? What else? What? Tools? A plan? Materials? And stinking hard work. Okay? So if I have the plans, if I have the materials, if I have the tools, how many know it's not going to build a house? What's it going to take? It's going to take some work. You're going to have to put something behind it. There's going to be a little bit of elbow grease. How many know in our faith, faith without works is what? How many know that takes, we got to work that faith. 
Not like as in, I've got to work in order to get my salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that we're given faith and we've got to stretch it. We've got to move it. We've got, we've got to do something here. We've got to build this thing. Not on our own, not on our own strength, not on our own initiative, but by Christ, right? By the Spirit of the living God. Because it's not by what? Might nor power, but by what? The Spirit of the living God. And so that's the only way that we can build this building. Now, Scripture, if you take a look at Scripture, go home, take a look at it, look up the word build, and look at how many Scriptures are out there where Jesus is referring to building the church, building the temple. Who builds the temple? He says the Gentiles are a part of that building the temple. The Jews are a part of building that temple. And together, we build a temple on his foundation. So go through Scripture. You can find all of that there. So in order to build, right, We must build each other up. This word also is in in reference to growing. How many know that in order to be built, when you're building something, what are you doing? You're expanding. You're growing something, right? So there's this growing piece that's in here. Now, there's this expectation, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14 and 6, and chapter 6, verse 1 says these things here. It says, There is much more we would like to say about this, but it is difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You have been believers for so long. How many have been believers for so long, right? So this is what we've got to look out for, right? You've been believers for, for so long that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic things about God's Word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot get solid food, cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and does not know how to do what is right. Solid food, though, is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. So, Let us drop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead to become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again from the fundamental importance of of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. So what what is he saying here? He's like, listen, we got to quit being babies. When you build something, you grow. And when you grow, what? You quit being a baby. And so all of us are in different spaces in our life, aren't we? All of us are in different paths on our growth with God. So again, there's no condemnation here. The question becomes, where are you at with God, right? What is God asking of you? Because sometimes we get to a difficult spot, don't we? And when we get to the difficult spot, we get to a place where we go, you know what? Doggone it. I'm tired of fighting. I'm just going to accept that as a part of who I am. And then we blame God again. Remember that default setting? God made me this way. I was like, what? No, he didn't, right? He didn't make you that way. He didn't make you with those negative deficits in your life. How many know there's scars, there's wounding, there's things that happen in our life that create that in us? It was never intended for you to carry it around, but you carry it around anyway. And so the question comes, am I going to continue to carry this stuff around? Am I, or am I going to grow up from that, be willing to go through the hard stuff, right? How many know it's not easy to grow up? How many know those growing pains when you grow up? How many know you have to, all of a sudden, you have to make life decisions at some point in time in your life and you can't just go around playing video games all day? How many know there's a place of growing up, right? And so the point being is, we've got to all mature. So... Here's what I want you to do, because what we try to do around here is make it personal for us, right? So I want you to take a look at your life, and I want you to ask the question, is there any area in my life that I've stalemated myself and I haven't grown beyond? If the answer is yes, then you can ask the question, what do I need to do to grow beyond this? And you probably already know that answer, and you've refused to work out that answer because it's too difficult to do the answer according to your mindset. So what I want to encourage you to do is as we continue to go through this, you're going to see here that as you continue to equip yourself in faith, you're going to start seeing, hey, listen, I can actually do that. You can overcome that. 
you can press through that and you don't have to remain there. How many know that there's people that say, you know what, I've been depressed all my life. My mom's depressed, my dad's depressed, everybody around me depressed. I'm just going to live with depression. How many know that's just not true? But how many know it takes a fight not to live in depression? How many know I have to work your faith not to live in depression? Right? How many know you have to speak the word over your life not to live in depression? There's things that you can do not to do that, right? And so, there's, and so I just want to be in a place where it's like, God, what are you doing? What are you saying? I want to be there. I want to do what you're doing. I want to grow up in you. I don't know about you, but I want to grow. I don't want to maintain. I just don't want to be just where I'm at today, and that's just where I'm at for the rest of my life, and I die there because there's a greater plan and a greater purpose for each one of our lives. The Bible says in Romans 12, 3, that each one of us has been given a measure of faith. The question is, what am I going to do, do with that measure of faith? It's, us, it's up to us to exercise that faith. It's up to us to grow it, not to remain how it was. So do you guys remember that story about the man who went away in the Bible and he had three servants? And then the three servants, he gave one, you know, five talents, cash, money, right? He gave another one two, and he gave another one one. Now, here's my thinking. I think he knew why he was giving each one those measures. How many think, right? I, th- I, think, I think he knew exactly, right? He, he knew by work ethic already, right? And he took, and, and the, he went away, and he came back, and he calls the servants in and says, where's my money? And the one with five, what did he do? Right, he doubled it, right? The one with two did what? Same thing, right? And the one with one? Here, master. Here's, here's your one. And the master's like going, what the heck? What do you mean that's my one? My expectation for you was to do something with that one. And he goes, man, even if you were to put it in the bank, you would at least gain some interest on it. It wouldn't have doubled it, but at least it would have got some interest on it. At least you could have done that. So to me, this is like us walking this life, and it's like we've all been given these talents. We've all been given gifts. We've all been given, right, something God wants to do in each and every one of us. And he's just encouraging us, going, hey, guys, get on my plan. Do it my way. When you do, you're going to double. How many want to double it? I want to increase. I want to see something increased in my life. I don't know about you, but I want to, I want to see some increase in my life. I want to watch God do some great things in my life. And so, I, so he, 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 he admonishes that servant, right? So the, the first guys, what does he say to the first guys? Well done, good and faithful servants. I want that. How many of you guys want that? I want that, right? And then what did he say to the one guy who buried it? He says, you wicked and slothful servant. How many know I don't want that? Anybody want that? Put your hand down. I, you, none of you want that, okay? None of you want that, okay? It's like, you think you might want that. You know, there's some, right? Because seriously, what are we doing to do the one versus the other in this room? And you are the only one who can tell that. You're the only barometer between you and God that can figure that thing out. But I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to figure that out. Am I doing that multiplicative thing, well done, that good and faithful servant side? Or am I doing the wicked, slothful thing? Am I being a slug? And where's my Christian walk at? Because God's asking us, man, let's not be slugs, Okay. Let's not be slothful. Let's move on with the things of God. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we move, continue to move into this? He says, then we build each other up. That's the next step. So the one thing is getting me moving, right? And in my moving, not when I'm perfect in my moving. How many realize that, right? How many, none of you are going to be perfect until Christ returns, right? Then you go to, right, be with him. Then per- perfection comes. Until then, guess what? You, you, none of us are perfect, right? Hear that noise? <laughs> That's amazing right there. I love loving our kids. So, and they're having fun, lots of fun. I, I might want to go up there right now. Um, so, it sounds like they're beating each other. I, I like that. Um, 
I, I like to beat kids. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Can you erase that, Shane, back there? <laughs> so, um, so anyway, um, so I want to be in that place, but but it's like so. But how many know? I it's not. I don't do it like man. When I'm perfect, then I'll go minister to somebody. How many of that's not true? In my imperfection, trusting in God, having faith in God, I go minister to somebody. That's how it's supposed to be. So then that's when the that's when the we thing comes in. So I've taken care of the me. Now we're moving into the we thing. And in Hebrews ten twenty four through twenty five says this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now in the day, in that day of his return is drawing near. So I sit there and look at this. I'm like, guys, listen, it's not just talking about church. How many know church is a great thing? Church is a great space to gather, to meet together, to challenge one another, encourage one another, love on each other, all that kind of stuff. But how many know we need each other outside of Sundays, right? And so we need each other, we need to rub shoulders with each other during the week and encourage one another during the week and going, man, it's going to be okay. You got this thing. Come on, you can overcome. Come on, you can do it, right? And so we're challenging one another, encouraging one another and into good works of God. Okay, verse 21 of Jude 21, chapter 1, 21. And await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. So in the literal translation of this, it's really interesting how this is actually said. It's said, it's said like this, yourselves in the love of God keep waiting. I like that. In the love of God keep waiting. In other words, I can't keep waiting unless what? I'm in the love of God. I've got to be in the love of God. As you're building yourself up in the word, you will be able to remain in God's love. So when we found ourselves in him, guess what? I'm in his love. When I'm, when, I, when I'm going after him, when I'm trying to build, when I'm trying to see this thing, and I'm, God, I want you in my life, I'm praying, I'm seeking after him, right? How many know that's when this building happens, right? And so it's like, it must, it is a must to be in the love of God because there's no other to wait, no other way to wait his return. And this word waiting here, it's a kind of an interesting word. This word waiting here is not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs, right? <sighs> I'm waiting. One day, he's coming back. This word waiting actually is an active waiting. This word here meant here in, in the Greek actually means this active waiting. It is, it is this waiting with an expectant heart and mind. It's a waiting, in other words, saying that I'm ready and willing to give and to receive at any moment. How many know that's a hard thing to do? How many know in our society... In our whole kind of, you know, being self-centered and all that kind of stuff. How many know it's hard to be ready and willing at any moment, right? But then what it says here, it's interesting. It's like, it's like preparing the house for someone's arrival. That's what it means to wait. Preparing, it's like preparing the house. For, anybody have any special guests ever come over to your house? What do you do to your house? Man, yeah, you're... <laughs> So you go over to their house and clean their house. So, so you go and you clean, right? You go and you round your house and you clean your house. You, you pick up everything, right? You're getting everything in order. You're making sure the faucets are all wiped down, all this other kind of stuff. Make sure there's no gunk in the sink, right? All that, right? It's like, and, and you're waiting, you're, you're preparing for someone to come to your house. This is what it means to be awaiting Christ's return in God's love. So in other words, I'm actively out there doing. I'm actively out there preparing. So what are we actively out there preparing? What kind of house are we preparing? So here's, and in other words, I'm out, I'm out in the highways and the byways. I'm out in my community. I'm out with my family. And I'm, and I'm encouraging them in the things of God, right? Because I'm actively waiting his return. And what am I doing to, during that time? I'm telling people about him. I'm sharing his love. I'm sharing his goodness. I'm sharing his mercy. I'm sharing his grace with these people. That's what we're doing. That's what we're actively doing. And then, um, oh, you know what I missed? I missed something up here. Did I miss something up here? Oh, yeah. 
I did miss something up here. So in verse 20, it says this. It says um, in verse 20 that, that the way that we, that we do this, I missed a very key thing, that the way that we do this is what? At the very end of verse 20, it says, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is huge because we cannot do this on our own. So it's praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, praying in accordance with the Holy Spirit. In other words, God, what are you saying? How many know that the Holy Spirit knows what the Father knows? And so it's really important going, Holy Spirit, I, I just need you. I need to know. I need to hear. And sometimes, you know, it's done that way. And you know what another way that it's done? It's by praying in tongues. I mean, the scripture talks about it. It says, it says sometimes, right, in Romans 8, 26 and 27, says this, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what, the, what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows that the Spirit, what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. How I many that's pretty cool? It's like... It's like, so sometimes I don't know what to pray, so what do I do? I pray, I pray in the Spirit. I pray in tongues. And it's like, and guess what he does? He, he, begins, he begins to move. Things begin to happen. I don't know about you, but if you, have had, if you pray in tongues, if you don't, you can. It's up to you. But the point is, if, when you pray in tongues, it's a crazy thing that takes place in the spiritual realm. If, if I was to ask you this, if, if you were given a project to work on, and it took a certain tool. Anybody ever done a project like that? I've had projects where it, it takes a certain tool to do it. And, and a screwdriver won't work. But you have a screwdriver. Or over here is another tool that is perfect for the job, that it fits perfectly and will do the job perfectly. Do you want to still try to work with the screwdriver? You can, Right? Some people choose to do that. No, I'm not going to go to the store and buy that, or I'm not going to, right? Well, this is not even, a, you don't even need to purchase this. It's sitting there waiting for you, and it's, it's the gift of tongues. And it's like, and there's, it's a tool to be used. Now, do we believe around here that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved? No, we don't believe that. I think that's just stupid. So, but do you, but can you pray in, can you pray in tongues? Can all believers pray in tongues? Yes, they can so it's a choosing whether or not I want the tool or not the tool. That's all. And so what I found out in my own life, right, because personal experience helps a lot, is that that tool has helped me out a lot. There's been times I've been frustrated, irritated, discouraged. How many know when you're frustrated, irritated, and discouraged, you don't want to do jack diddly squat? And so when I'm frustrated, irritated, or discouraged, the best thing that I can do, and again, it's a decision of my mind, right? It's changing the roadways in my brain. And, and the best thing that I can do is to pray in the Spirit. Because I, I just can't even think of the words right now. And, and you know, during that time of praying to the Spirit, it calms me. It so God begins to work on me. He begins to speak. He begins to share. He begins to show me pathways. It's, it's craziness of what can happen. So I want to encourage you. If you don't, you can, okay? If you do, do it more. Because it's really, it's really a huge help. So let's jump back down to verse 22. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering must show mercy. In other words, it's a directive. You have to do it. You need to show mercy. But how many know I can't show mercy unless I'm in what? God's love. Right? So I can't show mercy unless I'm in God's love. And mercy really simply means compassion, pity, empathy. In other words, it's extending God's love to those who don't deserve it, those who have hurt you, offended you, or discarded you. Anybody ever had any of those people in your life? Okay. So I have to show mercy. Even as difficult as it is, I need to show mercy. Even though that I may never trust them again, I still have to show mercy. Okay? So I have to show mercy with those places. So I want to encourage you. Let's show mercy. Why? Because there's something that happens when we show mercy, what do we get back? Mercy. Okay? So verse 23, we're going to end here. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others. But, but do so with great caution, hating the sin that contaminates their lives. In other words, when we walk in God's love, full of faith, we're able to show mercy to those around us and then can snatch them from God's judgment by introducing them to Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ, remember it's not his last name, Jesus Christ, Jesus the anointed one. 
And when I introduce them to Jesus, the anointed one, he can change and transform their lives as well. But it says this, it says, but you got to be cautious. So in other words, what he's saying is like, be full yourself, put your Oscar Max on yourself, put your O2 on yourself before you try to administer O2 to somebody else. Make be full before you start going into some of these places. Because some people, right, if I, if I, was, a, um, if I was a drug addict or if I was uh, someone who was an alcoholic, how many know that I've got to be very careful, right, with my friends who are drug addicts and alcoholics? I got to know when it's appropriate, when the time is appropriate, right, for me then to go minister to them because otherwise I might fall into that again. Do you understand? So there's some very practical things that go with this. And so the question then is, well, how do I reach them? Well, you don't necessarily have to. Others can, or others can through you, or you can take a friend with you, right? How many know that taking a friend is a good, good idea, right? It helps keep things strong and, and all that. Kind of, so just, just be wise in what you do. So another, but it's, again, it comes back down to this whole thing. Put your mask on yourself before you put the mask on somebody else. Be filled yourself before you try to fill somebody else. So here's my encouragement. Well, what's that take? Does that take a year? Does that take a month? Does that take? No. Listen, it could take 30 seconds. See, this is where people kind of get off. Well, I don't have the training. Well, I've never been to Bible school. So? This is where, this, yeah, this is where the Holy Spirit comes in our lives. And it's like, remember what I've told you guys. Listen, it's about what? Sharing God's goodness. What has he done in your life that has been good? Can you share that with somebody? It's that simple. The love of God, surrounded in the love of God. How can I share that love with somebody else? So this is how we're built up in our faith. One, pray in the Holy Spirit. Number two, stir each other up. Hang out with each other. Stir each other up. Encourage one another, right? Three, keep yourself in God's love. When you start noticing that you're not in God's love or others notice that you're not in God's love and share that with you, <laughs> anybody ever heard of that happen? <laughs> so, and then when you notice, when you recognize you're not in God's love, get back in God's love, right? So how do I do that? I get back in the word, I get back in worship, I get back in fellowship, those kind of things. And then show mercy. When I show mercy, mercy is shown back to me. And lastly, rescue others. When I put my attention and time and focus on rescuing others, it takes my focus and my time and attention off of me and all my issues. And things get, begin to get resolved around me when I put my attention on some others. How many know that to be true? When I'm so self-centered, guess what all I see? All I see is a magnification of all my problems. But when I get off of me and I help others out, my problems become dim, and then all those problems start to get solved as well while I'm helping others. So let's reach out to one another. Stand on your feet with me. So when you feel your faith being challenged in some way, it may be, it may be discouragement of stuff that's going on around you. It may be someone act, actively coming against you at work or at home or family members. When your faith is being attacked, when that kind of stuff is actually happening to you, I want to encourage you, build up your faith. Build up your faith. Build up your faith by praying in the Spirit. Build, build up your faith by getting in the Word. Build up your faith by surrounding yourself in God's love. Build up your faith by, by snatching others. Build up your faith by showing mercy on somebody. But build up your faith. If you'll just build up your faith, you'll see that all this stuff begins to start coming together. And even if it doesn't... And here's the deal, guys. Just because you, you're, you're discouraged in an area, don't quit. Don't quit. Just because you didn't get the answer you wanted right now doesn't mean the answer's not coming. Don't quit. I mean, what, what good's that going to do? You know, it just, it just undoes everything you've been fighting for. When you quit, what happens? You just kind of throw up your air, everything else goes away, and then you got to kind of start from ground zero again. Quit it. Don't, don't quit. Don't, don't, don't keep pushing. Who cares? But it doesn't look like it's going to happen. I don't care. Did God put that in your heart? 
Was that something he shared with you? Was that something he wanted you to do? Was that a person he wanted you to reach? Was that, was that a job he wanted you to get? Was that a, whatever that, whatever that is, keep pushing. Don't stop and watch what God will do, right? And, 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 and just watch him, watch him move, watch him work. It's like sometimes we give up too quick, right? We get a little discouraged, right? Someone comes alongside and says something that you don't like. And all of a sudden, ah, shucky darns. I guess, I guess they're right. You know what I'm saying? What do you mean they're right? Who's right? Are they right or is God right? I'm thinking God. I would take God's precedent over man's precedent, right? Man's, God's words over man's words. So, so don't give up. Don't lose hope. Keep pressing in. Because he makes ways where what? Where there seems to be no way. So, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for being a God who is so good and loving. A God who is full of peace and grace and mercy and comfort. A God who loves his kids. A father. A God who desires that everything that we put our hands to to prosper. A God who sees way ahead of what we see right here in front of us. A God who knows what's going on. And so, again, God, we say this morning, you are God, and we put our trust in you. You're an exceptional God, you, and you do exceptional things. You do big things. You're a big God, and you do big things. This morning, if you've struggled and, and your faith has become weakened, and you're like, or you took an inventory of yourself this morning, and you're like, you know what? still drinking milk and I need to chew on some meat I need to grow up I need to build my faith, I don't need to stop where I'm at, I don't need to be mediocre in my faith and you're saying that with me this morning, you're saying Pastor Dan, I, I just, I don't want to I don't, I don't want to remain there, I want to push on, I want to push forward, I want to I want to hear the voice of God clear. I want to see the miracles happen around me. I want to experience him to the full, not just halfway measures, but just literally to the full. I want to live my life on full. I want to 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 be an adventure for my I want my my time with God just to be full. And if you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want that for me. I I desire that in my life and and I don't and I want to press on and I want to I want my faith to be strengthened I want my faith to grow I want to build my faith would you just lift your hands all across this room and we're going to pray together Father you see our hands lifted up God we're believers that are saying we, we, we want more and we don't want to do it on our own we want our faith to be strengthened and we don't want to go to our default settings of that God you did this to us somehow but God, we want to go to another default and change our default to, God, you're God and I trust you. I don't get it, I don't understand it, but I trust you nonetheless. And God, we desire that you would fill us, fill us full, full of your love, your mercy, your grace, your tenderness. Fill us full, God, that we would, that we would be able, our minds would be set on you and that we would truly have the mind of Christ and we would think like you, and we would process like you. That we would have mercy on those that are around us, that we would be full and surrounded in your love, that we would, God, that we would be able to pray in the Holy Spirit, and that we'd be able to pray in tongues and we'd be able to, be able to do battle and, and see victory. So God, I just say thank you. I say thank you that you're who you are and that you fill us up that you see our hands lifted up as going, God, this is our desire. This is who we are. We desire this. And I, God, I say thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you that you give us the desires of our heart. Your word is true. And we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, great morning. This morning when you get...